two. Good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigilla, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government, and joining us today is Health Officer Dr. Kisha Davis, as well as Dr. James Bridgers, who is the Chief of Public Health Services. Mr. Sean Aldano, Program Administrator, Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response for the Department of Health and Human Services. Joining us today as well is Dr. Earl Strider, who's Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, and Chris Conkling, who is the Director of the Department of Transportation. We do have a special guest today, Ms. Laura Mitchell, who is the Chair of the Montgomery County Alcohol and Other Drugs Abuse Council. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Members of the media, remember to use the chat during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And uh, with that, I toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, so thank you for joining us again today. Uh, we've got a lot to get to today from talking about um, fentanyl use, particularly among teens, to an update on a money-saving program run through our Department of Transportation. And I'm glad that Chris Conklin is able to join us today to talk about changes to fair share. I also have Laura Mitchell, Chair of the Substance Use Prevention Committee, um, here as well to talk about um, concerns in the community following recent overdoses. First, though, I want to address the continued anti-Semitic incidents that have been occurring in Montgomery County. <clears throat> this past week, we saw anti-Semitic flyers distributed in the Kensington area, falsely linking ancestors of our Jewish community to the cause of slavery. And last week, uh, students at three schools were punished for drawing swastikas on des desks in their classrooms. Last month, it was anti-Semitic graffiti um, painted outside a high school in Bethesda, and some teachers were sent anonymous and disturbing letters. In the fall, we dealt with more anti-Semitic messages on bus stops and fences near the Bethesda trolley trail. Police are still investigating these incident incidents, and a new $5,000 reward was recently established by the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington and the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington for information that leads to an arrest and conviction. <clears throat> Anyone with information about these crimes can call Crime Solvers of Montgomery County at 1-866-411-TIPS. It's not just anti-Semitic incidents of hate, but we've also seen vandalism in historic black churches, hate crimes against our Asian American Pacific Islander community, as well as protests from Proud Boys trying to intimidate our LGBTQ plus residents. There's no easy way to put an end to this act and these acts of hatred. I wish there were, um, but we're actively working with police, the community and other partners to solve and prevent this behavior. And if, if you are aware of it, if you see incidents of this, please report it to the police. Um, if you have any inkling about who may be doing this, please contact us. Um, we need to put a stop to it. We need to make it as difficult for people to commit these kinds of acts as possible. Before we get into our health updates, I wanted to take a moment to highlight our fair share program that is very important to our climate action plan goals. <clears throat> Today, we have Chris Con Conklin joining us to update you on two new initiatives that our Department of Transportation is engaged in that are designed to encourage drivers and riders to change their current habits to help reduce carbon emissions. One program benefits our ride on bus users, and the other is an expansion of our efforts to make charging stations more accessible for electric vehicle owners. Both programs are extremely helpful to our climate action plan goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As you know, greenhouse gas emissions are cut in half when a commuter uses public transportation as compared to using a personal car. And 40% of Montgomery County's greenhouse gas totals come from automobiles. This is a key sector that we have to address if we're going to reach our goal of 100% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2035. Fair share can definitely help, and we just need business and commuters to utilize these benefits. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris for a moment now to kind of explain what this is and take any questions you have about the program. Chris, it's all yours. Chris, 
Chris. There I go. Sorry for that. Oh, we hear you now. Perfect. Good morning. I'm looking forward to sharing some of the details of the Fair Share program. This is a program that Montgomery <laughs> County has had in place for um, quite some time. And the benefit of this program is it allows employers to provide um, free or discounted transit or uh, parking access at Metro parking, light, parking lots. The county will participate with employers to, um, to provide a financial incentive and a tax-free benefit to employees up to $300 a month for their commuting expenses, as long as that workplace is within Montgomery County. As a business, you're, you would be responsible for the first $25 of these costs and the remainder of the benefits provided to the employee would be reimbursed by the county up to the budget available for this program, which is $150,000 for this fiscal year. This is a program that obviously did not have a lot of enrollment in 2020 and 2021. And we're hoping to see more engagement in this program as the benefit to employees has increased by uh, $20 from what was previously $280 under the IRS guidelines to $300 per month this year. So your employees could be getting a very substantial uh, tax-free commute benefit here, as high as $3,600 per employee per year. And uh, the, the program can provide up to $40,000 to any employer willing to participate in this to fund this program. So very exciting program, a very substantial benefit and incentive for those employers that have employees returning to the workplace, and we'd like to encourage them to rediscover public transit as the preferred means for, for their getting to work. The other, uh, another item I'd like to share uh, that will be uh, announced later this week is that we have added um, more ports, electric vehicle charging ports to the county network. We are up to 56 charging locations operated by MCDOT, and that's serving the largest number of plug-in vehicles that are registered in the state of Maryland, 19,000 plug-in vehicles in Montgomery County, and that's a third of all of the plug-in vehicles statewide. So great uh, track record so far in electric vehicle adoption, and we're hoping that the addition of these ports um, will encourage people to continue to purchase uh, electric vehicles instead of traditionally fueled vehicles. Eight of these ports are added in the NOAA garage in Silver Spring. Four were in the Cordell St. Elmo garage in downtown Bethesda, and four in the Wheaton Marketplace garage next to the Wheaton Metro Station. There are eight more planned that will happen in the Bethesda Elm garage in, in Bethesda, and in the Cameron Street garage in Silver Spring later this year. Uh, this is interesting. These ports are being installed as part of a cooperative program with PEPCO. They are installing and operating these and they're slightly different and will have a different uh, um, account system than the uh, chargers that we already have that are operated by ChargePoint. And I do wanna note, we had some reliability problems with the EV charger due to supply chain issues and replacement parts. Uh, there's been a sweep to get all of those repaired and operational. If you encounter a charger that isn't operational, please let us know through 311 but we're hoping that we have a much better experience now that those supply issues, supply chain issues seem to have worked their way through the system. The other thing I would wanna note is that there are 1,600 other EV ports operated by other entities around the county. So you'll find these in retail locations in other public facilities like, um, like libraries and rec centers, uh, but accessing EV charging is nowhere near as challenging as it was a few years ago. It is becoming less and less of a barrier to EV adoption. You can also install EV charging in your home. Uh, in 2020, uh, DOT and the De Department of Permitting Services uh, released guidelines for uh, installation of electric vehicle charging stations at your home in locations where you don't have your own off-street parking uh, location. The third thing I wanted to talk to about today was the continued implementation of our zero emission bus uh, transition plan. Um, this county executive has recommended $2 million as part of his capital budget uh, for us to begin planning for a new depot that will allow us to fully convert the, the fleet to non-carbon um, non uh, fuel sources. 
And we are also implementing work on our hydrogen fueling pilot at our Gaithersburg Depot now, and that's gonna be part of our mix going forward. So very exciting um, announcements there. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit today is that the ride-on um, schedules will be changing this Sunday. We are having time changes on 31 routes. We will be increasing service on about 29 routes, and we have four routes that the service is actually being reduced um, because the ridership is relatively low on those. And I have to admit, we don't like to have route reductions, uh, but one of the routes that ha is having a schedule change with less service is the one that I use most frequently. So these are not um, these are truly the routes that are having the lowest ridership in our system. And that's that service is being transferred to the places where we are seeing more ridership. You can find information about the service changes on our website. And again, that will be going into effect this Sunday. So happy to take any questions on any of these programs. Thank you, Director Conklin. Uh, members of the media, we are going to open it up at this moment for any questions regarding fair share and or other transportation topics. We'll wait a second or two to give you the opportunity to uh, get engaged. Laura, can I jump in here? I you? see it. All right, go ahead, <laughs> Mr. Steve Bonnell with us of eight. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Coughlin, you mentioned that for the, the fair share, the tax credit is increasing up to $300 a month. Is that from a lower figure, I guess? What was it at before this change, I guess? Yes, uh, it was $280, uh, and the IRS has increased that level to $300 this year. Okay. Um, and I just want to actually talk about the bus routes, too. Um, what data did you use? Can you just explain the methodology a little bit more about what went into increasing service on what, those roughly 29 routes and then decreasing service on the four? Is it just obviously, I mean, I'll just let you speak to that, I guess. Uh, happy to, Steve. We have automatic passenger counters on each bus, and they, they are able to let us know how many people are using the service. So in those locations where we start to have some crowding on routes, we look to add service and uh, buses that have you know very low ridership, perhaps some empty trips or a couple passengers per trip. We look to see if we can make adjustments to be able to use the operators and the vehicles more effectively in other places where demand is higher. Uh, we, we try to keep those minimum headways at a, at a point where people can continue to rely on the service and it's not so infrequent that it's unreasonable. Um, and typically we try to keep the minimum uh, just uh, time between buses at 30 minutes, but we go through this process normally three times a year to make these adjustments. In the last two years, we've been doing this on a much more frequent basis as we've been getting more operator availability and ridership has been returning to our system. It might be testing your memory here, but I see these emails come through that you know, you're looking at a route or a couple of routes and that obviously this is a substantial amount of routes to 30. Is there a precedent here for where the county's taken this much action on this many routes? Do you follow what I'm asking? Yes, I mean, to, in our previous um, normal mode of operation, we would be making adjustments to our route system wide about three times a year. So this is not unusual, but as Steve, as you know, over the last 18 months, we've been adjusting the route network more frequently as we've restored services, op bus operators have become more available due to the uh, county's program to increase pay and, and increase the number of activities we're doing to recruit bus operators. Uh, and that's been matched by um, some return to, in our ridership that we've seen over that same period. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, members of the media, any more questions regarding these transportation topics for uh, Director Conklin? No more questions? Okay, going once. <clears throat> Prize on this. All right. Thank you, Director, for joining us today, this morning. And uh, Mr. County Executive, we can transition now to the public health update and other topics. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you, Chris, for joining me today. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing more young lives put in jeopardy because of fentanyl. And earlier this month, a 15-year-old died um, 
from an overdose. It's one of eight recent um, overdose deaths in Montgomery County. The Montgomery County Fire Department has reported an additional 38 people would have been killed since December, if not for the life-saving drug naloxone, also known as Narcan. And just yesterday, we had another overdose in our schools. <clears throat> Opi opioid misuse and overdoses have been a major public health problem in our county for several years. But more recently, the use of fentanyl and pills in the younger age of those misusing um, drugs is very concerning. Last year, youth overdoses in Montgomery County alone increased by 78%. Uh, Non-fatal overdoses in youth went from 22 in 2021 to 37 in 2022, and fatalities went from 5 in 21 to 11 in 22. Um, so these are significant increases. Um, fentanyl is a synthetic drug that mimics an op opioids, and it's pressed into pill form so that it looks like and is sold as other drugs. They literally look like a drug that is not what they are. Uh, users taking the pills may not realize the danger they are putting themselves in. And nationally, 71% of adult ad of adolescents, sorry, adolescent overdose deaths in 2021 involve fentanyl. Uh, this Saturday at Clarksburg High School, MCPS is hosting a fentanyl awareness forum for families helping to give them the tools for prevention and helping protect our children. It's free. It's going to take place from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. in the school cafeteria, and the forum will also be live streamed on the MCPS homepage. I invited Laura Miller, Mitchell, sorry, who is a substance abuse prevention committee chair for the Montgomery County Council of PTAs, who will be on today's briefing to give you some remarks and take any questions you may have. And I want to thank Laura in advance for joining us. Uh, since September, hospitals in our areas have been dealing with triple threat of RSV, flu, and COVID-19. The tridemic has put constant pressure on our hospitals for many weeks now, and it strains their capacity, and it's prompting warnings from health experts to consider treating mild cases of COVID-19 through your doctor and avoiding the hospitals. Um, this week, our hospitals remain nearly full, but our COVID-19 counts are showing signs of regressing. And uh, as you can see from the drop in cases in this chart, this may seem like we're out of the woods, but we're not. The percentage of hospital beds devoted to COVID patients remains elevated and keeps our community level status at medium. Additionally, emergency room activity is still high and we're recommending to residents to use only the ER for life-threatening issues and use urgent care as primary care and telehealth to ensure that our emergency departments are available to those in urgent need. We talked about this you know, last week, I think a little bit, but our ambulances are still backing up. They're getting to the hospital and the hospitals have so many patients, they're not able to process the patients that are coming in by ambulance. And when you're not able to process them, they wind up sitting in the ambulances and those ambulances aren't able to return to service. And that puts our supply of ambulances under strain because we count on them being able to deliver patients and then be available for the next call. <clears throat> so when they're tied up at hospitals, just waiting to get into the emergency room, um, this creates a health problem down the chain. So be aware of that situation. Go to the hospital when you need to, but if you don't need to, please take advantage of other services that are available. Vaccines and boosters continue to be the best form of protection. And we can tell by COVID rates this winter as compared to last year, they're working. And you know this chart shows you, um, this is cases by, um, by vaccination type, and it, takes, it looks at the number of breakthrough cases. And as you can see, there are significantly fewer breakthrough cases in all age ranges for people who've had the bivalent booster than for people who had the original booster. And so this chart kind of reinforces the message we've been trying to send to people that the booster while not 100% effective against getting sick, it's much more effective against getting really sick. And uh, so please, you know, please go out and get your bivalent boosters if you haven't done this already. As we'd like to remind people or don't like to remind people, there's really no reason for people to be dying of this anymore. 
we have the tools between treatment and vaccines uh, to prevent death. And uh, the fact that people are playing Russian roulette and not getting vaccinated continues to put more people at risk. Uh, we continue to see demand for bivalent boosters continue to drop, and that's one of the problems. And this chart was broken down by age and race of who's taken the new booster. I'm very concerned that 46% of our 65 and older population has not yet taken their bivalent booster, as that age cohort is the most vulnerable to serious illness or death from the virus. And that's something we've seen from the very beginning of corona. Um, these were where the major amounts of our of victims came. It also isn't a good sign that only about a quarter of all adults, 18 to 49 in the county, haven't, uh, have, only, have not gotten this new shot either. That's too many unvaccinated or unprotected people out there. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to our public health team now as well as Ms. Mitchell for their remarks, and then we're gonna take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. I'll share, as we do each week, a, a few more metrics that we're tracking on COVID and some of the other infectious diseases. Um, again, we're, 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 as the county executive said, uh, our case numbers have been coming down a bit. Um, you can see here the uh, still the significant elevation of, of individuals in the hospital with a COVID diagnosis. Um, we, we know that some of these are people who are there because of COVID and some um, COVID was identified during another visit. Uh, looking along the East Coast, we, we've seen our, our other neighboring um, cities on the East Coast also have this decline in cases. So that's encouraging, um, but we still remain at an elevated level um, overall. And as you can see from our emergency department um, uh, visits, these are our snapshots each day of, of the number of patients at emergency departments. Again, this past week, we had another uh, day where we had more than 300 patients in our, our EDs. Um, and this is the strain that our county executive was referencing and is um, extending out to our, our EMS units as well. Um, with fewer cases, uh, some of the question is why is, it, why, is, why is there still strains on our hospitals? And some of it is the different type of patients that are, they're seeing now. Whereas the previous few months, it was a lot of pediatric patients, um, many of whom have uh, speedier recoveries. Uh, you can see from our chart here, these are just patients with flu-like symptoms that range from COVID to influenza uh, to other respiratory disease. Um, a lot of the patients now are our seniors, and um, certainly they can sometimes have longer stays and, and require more rehabilitation after a serious illness. Uh, we're still tracking our, our variants. The XBB variant is now projected to be well over half of their, our new cases in our region. Um, and again, we've, we've had another month with um, January already where we're seeing more than uh, a, a death a day with a COVID diagnosis. So again, we're still at a, a time of year where this is, uh, this is of significant risk to our residents. Uh, looking at influenza, um, we, we are seeing the, the cases of influenza recede across the nation, um, and this, this appears to be similar to uh, what we saw with RSV in that it happened early, it happened um, very quickly at a very high level, and now it's starting to recede. Uh, you can see the yellow lines there is this year, the red lines are the, the activity we had back in 2019, 2020 before COVID um, became a, a more significant illness here. So you can see it, it it's kind of hit at different times and at, at different um, volume levels. And the, the mortality associated with influenza across the state is now up to 52 deaths. Um, and then finally, again, we're happy to report that across Maryland, there have been no new cases of MPOX uh, this past week. Those are the updates I have from our Pulse report. Um, and uh, I'd like to give an opportunity for uh, Dr. Davis, Dr. Bridgers, or Dr. Stoddard to add uh, anything additional if they'd like. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell, great job. Um, I think really the highlight messaging here is also what the county executive highlighted earlier. Um, there are some promising signs that we're starting to turn the corner on COVID, but we're still seeing significant um, backups in our hospitals. And so um, continuing to protect the, the vulnerable population, the elderly, 
um, encouraging them to get their boosters, everyone to get their boosters. That's how we're going to slow the spread um, and really saving the emergency room for emergencies using your PCP, urgent care, telehealth, all of those other modalities um, so that we can keep our emergency rooms uh, open and efficient to take care of those, uh, those crises. When our ERs are full of COVID, it makes it harder to attend to other things like strokes and heart attacks and car accidents that we know that they're still seeing every day. Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Stoddard, anything else to add? Sure, thank you, Dr. Davis, Mr. O'Donnell. I have nothing else to add to your comments um, and Mr. O'Donnell comments. I will um, <clears throat> turn it over to Dr. Stoddard this is time. Yeah, the one note I wanted to provide is I, I've seen some inquiries online about from from individuals who got the bivalent vaccine very early in September, September 1st. There is no recommendation yet from the FDA or CDC about when another dose of the bivalent vaccine will be appropriate. And so we will be sure to provide information to the public about when that should occur. But uh, the, the reality is that, you know, at least for a solid six months after that first vaccine, you're going to likely still have very, very high levels of protection. And so um, my sense is probably sometime in the spring, you will see a recommendation coming from the FDA on or CDC on what the future of the bivalent vaccines are. So I know some of our elderly or immunocompromised residents have asked questions about that. And we will be sure to provide information as we hear about what the what the federal government's recommending with regard to additional booster doses in future months. Thank you, Dr. Stotter and uh, HHS team. Uh, Ms. Mitchell opening remarks from you before we open it for the Q&A portion of this presentation. Hi, yes. Um, I do appreciate the, the time in, in addressing everyone today. We have a forum on Saturday, as was mentioned, the family uh, forum on fentanyl, because we are seeing increases in youth use. And that is not exclusive to Montgomery County. I know when you're the first ones that are really talking about it, um, which is the first step in solving it, it tends to get, get a lot of attention. Uh, this is a national problem. This is not an MCPS problem or Montgomery County or even Maryland problem. It's everywhere. Um, it's unfortunate that we are seeing this more and more in our youth. We say, you know, the num numbers are trending down overall, but that's from a historic high, even for adults. So this is something that affects absolutely everybody, anybody. It can happen from an accident or an injury. It can happen from a wisdom tooth pull or, or any of those things. So we want to share that information. I have lived experience with my child for 15 years in um, active substance use disorder, and he's seven years in recovery now. And I look at the things that I know now, I wish I knew then. And that's our mission is to try to, uh, through Montgomery Goes Purple, not just celebrate recovery as we did in September, but to work on the prevention all year long so that those, our youth and other people never have to look for recovery or work so hard for recovery. Uh, this thing is like a really pretty jacket that you put on from the store and it looks wonderful and you can't wait to wear it. But every time you put it on, it gets a little bit heavier and a little bit heavier. And then at one point it locks on and you can't take it off ever. Uh, and that's what we need for our young people to know. We need for our parents to know what to look for and um, what to do if you see something that's concerning, how to get help. Those are the things that we'll be addressing at this forum and it's critical. Um, we'll also have Narcan training and distribution there. That's the overdose reversal drug. And I would personally be happy if everybody had it had, and was trained to use it because it's very, very simple. It's safe to use. Nothing happens if it's not an overdose and you find someone that's unconscious and you use it, nothing happens. Um, and it's free and you don't know whose life you might save or what they might go on to do. Um, I think it's really important. Every single person, uh, it may be the first time they tried something and everybody is vulnerable to it and everybody is worth saving. So, um, that's the mission of Montgomery Goes Purple and partnering with MCPS to get these information sessions and prevention work in the schools and get getting students who we've missed that prevention window on into treatment. That's our goal. That's what we're working for here. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell for those remarks and for joining us today. Members of the media, now we're going to open it up for the Q&A portion of this presentation. Remember to use the chat. And up next first is actually Stephanie Ramirez from uh, Fox 5 DC. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, happy new year, everyone. Haven't talked to most of you since 
Um, just want to ask the county executive about the illicit drug um, and fentanyl use in Montgomery County and the concerns. One thing that we're continuing to hear from parents is the concern that certain communication cannot be shared because of FERPA and HIPAA laws. Um, specifically, we were told by the county's uh, school press team that they cannot share if a specific overdose happens and they can only share if a fatal overdose happens after the parent gives permission. Um, County Executive, have you, have any, has anyone raised concerns to you about this? And is there anything that your office can do if you are looking at this in regards to how to share some kind of information or get the information out there more to these parents uh, in this matter? Please uh, unmute, Mr. County Executive. I'm, I'm a little confounded by the question because I just read, read you a number about the number of non-fatal overdoses and the number of fatal overdoses. So it's not that the number, the numbers don't go out there. Um, I, I don't know, nobody from the school system has talked to me and nobody's spoken to me about what the school system may be saying about HIPAA. I do know that they can't tell you who overdosed. Um, there may be a different case if it's a fatality, but you cannot report somebody's health condition any more than they can tell you who tests positive for a COVID test. So uh, that may be one of the limits of the HIPAA law, but I'm not in a position to answer that. Um, we don't, these aren't decisions we make for the school system. They get this from their legal staff and and the question might be, is this, been, is this true in all schools in the state? And is this, is this a state policy? I don't know whether any of the folks on our medical team know what the HIPAA rules are, but if you have any of them better than I do, let me <laughs> feel free to join me. Well, so FERPA obviously guides, guides what schools can release information about the students. And that's obviously much different. It's even, it's, has complexities even beyond standard HIPAA, which obviously the Health and Human Services, and I'm sure all of the public health speak, officials can speak to HIPAA, but obviously FERPA applies to different standards as well. But the one thing I would say, uh, Stephanie, is um, it shouldn't matter a whole lot because I think every parent of a high schooler, and I, I have a 13-year-old, so I've had this, I, I quite literally had the fentanyl conversation with her last week, given what we've seen in MCPS. Like I, I, it seems, you know, it seemed ludicrous to me for the, me at the time to, to talk to a 13 year old, but it's not like we're see we are seeing, uh, you know, younger people experimenting with narcotics uh, or, or even what they perceive to be prescription drugs that are often laced with other things. And so, frankly, from a perspective of a, of a parent, you should assume that if your child is in a high school at this point, they are they, it's it, it's not, you know, it's not ex the exclusive issue of Silver Spring or Germantown or or even Montgomery County that they're going to be exposed to opportunities to, you know, for potential taking of prescription drugs and, and, and overdoses. And so I think to a degree, it might give you a false, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're only focused, oh, I'm only going to educate my student when I see an overdose, you're missing an opportunity to have prevented that your student being that overdose by having the conversation with them early and often uh, about, the risks of, uh, of of taking prescription drugs and not knowing what's in them, peer pressure with regard to taking uh, uh, unknown substances uh, from other people that that you know that you know there there's a lot of contamination of of even prescription medications or things that look like prescription medications that are often not prescription medications. Could I just tag onto that for a second? The American Pediatrics Association recommends that you. Doctors begin screening for substance use at age nine. So even middle school is not too early uh, to start talking about it. It's not even just high school. It is a conversation even with kindergartners about not putting things in their mouth that look like candy if they weren't given that by their, their parent, their gummies, and lots of other things that look like candy, even the rainbow fentanyl. So it's important to have those conversations, as Dr. Sauter said, very early, very often, and with appropriate language. Uh, on the MontgomeryGoesPurple.org website, you'll find information about appropriate language to use. If we don't use the right language, we are telling our kids they're bad people, bad making bad choices with bad parents and, and all of these things. So when they are faced with this, who are they gonna go to? 
they don't want to make their parent a bad parent. They don't want to be a bad person. So it's really important that we use the right language when we're talking about this and invite them to talk to us and make it easy by starting those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, do you have any follow up questions, Stephanie? You're good? Uh, no, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. All. Uh, okay, great. I see Zoom user hand up. I believe that's Paul Wachner, MBC4. You're up next. Go ahead. You're right. That is me. Um, <laughs> Question, uh, does the security staff at the high schools and the middle schools all carry Narcan? And secondly, um, with the uh, community engagement officers not on the grounds of the schools now, um, is, there, is there now, uh, have you seen an increase? Now, let me check that question. Is there now a concern that perhaps we're in the past where you had SROs approached by kids saying that there was drugs going around the school. Now you don't have these community engagement officers on the campuses, so the kids are not going to these officers anymore. What do you, what do you make of that, Mr. Erick, County Executive? Do you have any comment on that? And, and, and of course, don't forget my first question about who's carrying the Narcan. <clears throat> Thank you. Earl, do you, do you know who carries the Narcan in the schools? I know they're, all, they're in all the health rooms, and so they're the, the all the health room staff and, and techs have been trained on Narcan administration. I believe Dr. Bridgers can correct me if that's wrong, but I know that we're in the health rooms. And I, interestingly, at 10 o'clock this morning, we had our normal opioid intervention team meeting. So I attended that and, and there was a very robust conversation between MCPS and county staff. Uh, Dr. Bridgers and was also there, so he can attest to this too. Um, we're working on much broadening out the number of people within the school school setting who have access to Narcan and who have Narcan on hand as we, you know, as a response to the increase that we've really seen over the last uh, year and a half or so. And so um, all the health rooms do have it. We're actually talking about putting it in all of the locations where AEDs are throughout the building. So that's much more ubiquitously available for potential overdoses. And I guess, uh, I, uh, Mark, do you want to talk about the second part of the question? Well, you know, as I would, I believe the school still has the community officers in the schools. They didn't take them out of the schools this year. Yeah. So the CEOs are still associated with all, they're not, it's, I think you're, he's, I think he's getting to the point between the SROs and the CEOs and the differentiation there, but the CEOs are still, I mean, as a reminder, the SROs uh, also serviced entire um, uh, clusters. They weren't necessarily always present only in the high schools. And as uh, Ms. Mitchell referred to, these challenges exist in our middle schools and 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 as well. And so I think the important point is that the CEOs are still engaging with students and and uh, talking to them. And that you know I think we we made the change even in the beginning of this year where they have an office in the space and students can actually go to them if they right. want to. They're just not proactively roaming the halls in the same way, and they're they're clearly not involved in student discipline in the same way that uh, the SRO program uh, had them operating previously. And so it's really taken them much more to being available to students and to faculty and staff and having a space in the schools, not necessarily being there. They're, they're not in a high school 24 seven. They weren't frankly as an SRO in a high school 20, you know, all throughout the school day, they're moving between the entire cluster. And so students can still go to the CEO in their school and know, will know who that individual is in their office. Uh, if they wish to, but the reality is that even for the you know for the number of CEOs we had, there are tenfold more security staff. There are more administrators. There are more counselors. There are a number of people in the school setting that someone can go to and report issues that they see with um, uh, you know a prescription drug abuse or illegal uh, substance drug abuse uh, if they if they wish to and and share information about it. Can I follow up? Do you yeah. have any further details on how this young girl was found inside the bathroom yesterday at Kennedy High School? Um, the radio traffic we were able to listen to said that she was unconscious and not breathing when she was found. Do you have any further details on how that happened? Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment beyond um, what's been released at this point, uh, obviously. I certainly am not going to um, break laws that I'm not fully, uh, you know, I'm not fully aware on FERPA. And so I don't, I don't I'm not going to certainly be in a position to go any further than, than what you already know. 
Does that answer all of uh, your questions, uh, Paul? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Could I make two quick comments? One is. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. One is, um, Dr. Sutter, and I'm very glad to hear that uh, we're talking at the community level, at the county level, about putting uh, Narcan in the AEDs and bleed kits in the schools. It's something I've been asking for for a while um, because if they're, our schools are huge, many of them are huge. And uh, the distance between the nurse's office and wherever a student is found can be the life, the difference between life and death. Um, so that's really important. And anybody could carry Narcan. Anybody can walk into any fire station in Montgomery County and get Narcan for free. That's important to know for our students, uh, for harm reduction reasons. And it's also uh, important that to know that anybody can carry Narcan. This, the uh, teachers, the security staff are working on uh, training them. That is, that is critical too. Everybody, the more people have it, the closer you are to rescuing somebody and saving their life. And, and at our forum on Saturday, we will also have a vaccine clinic adjacent to that. And anyone 50 plus that's getting a vaccination will get a, a grocery gift card. So we are really targeting with this grant that we have from National PTA, um, getting our, our 50 plus community vaccinated and boosted. So I encourage you to come and learn something and get your vaccine. And just because we're talking about the forum on Saturday, uh, Director Conklin, I've been going back and forth on this today. We can announce also the bus routes 10 and 75 will be free. And those routes will serve it free from 7 a.m. to, I believe, 2 p.m. on Saturday to allow more people to attend the forum without having to worry about uh, how they can get there. So those two routes during the 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, time frame will be free. Uh, obviously, you know, the county executive has, has made very clear that it's important that we we make opportunities available to all of our residents. And so, you know, talking to Director Conklin, we're going to, you know, we believe that will be an additional way for people to feel that they can participate and not be excluded based on. And I will also note, this was actually a recommendation that came in from a county resident, Bridget Howe, and, and we thought it was a reasonably, it was a really good suggestion. So I want to credit her for the suggestion and we're going to make it happen. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Ms. Mitchell, can you remind all of us of time and location for this forum on Saturday? Yes, the location is Clarksburg High School in the cafeteria. The Coke trailer will be parked right outside of there, the mock teen bedrooms so that adults can tour. The time is um, from 9.30 to 11.30, but the resource tables and the Coke trailer will be there at 9, and we hope to see everyone there. We'll have refreshments and uh, a lot of information. Thank and you. And free Narcan. Thank you. Members of the media, any other uh, questions for officials? No questions? Go ahead once. Twice? Well, I guess we're done for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you all for being here. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone.